This is Sleeping in Trees, the audiobook, Chapter 30, Red Menace. One of the dumber things we did one hot Saturday afternoon had to do with straws. Dork and I were out front across the street in our neighbor's tropical plantings, playing with a few. We had found a shaded section of pure white sand in between some towering, long-leaf cacti. How we came to be doing this is beyond my recollection. Just the same, Dork and I had straws. They were the old waxed paper kind, the precursor to today's plastic variety. Typically, we pretended straws were cigarettes and would try to smoke them. This was usually short-lived and not recommended. We realized after one or two puffs that one's lungs did not enjoy smoke from burning wax paper flowing through them. Further, Doing so quickly ends in extreme heat, followed by flames as the straw ignites in a blaze. This day we discovered that we could aim a straw down close to the sand and by blowing through it, create a small irrigating dredge. By blowing and blowing and moving the straw along, we could carve away large sections of sand. We dredged away with our straws with no particular plan or aim. It wasn't long before we happened upon our number one enemy the red ant. Next to mosquitoes, red ants were the most prevalent and painful insects in our young lives. They blanketed South Miami, and no matter where we were outside, they seemed to be right nearby. If the ground was hard and sandy, watch out, as it was likely that a major infestation would be underfoot. Or one could be walking through four inches of newly planted sod, as lush as any ever laid down, and in an instant, A massive swarm could be rushing up bare legs. They gave no quarter, attacking aggressively with abandon. Many a time while out playing, we would look down only to realize that we had been standing atop an ant pile. In a few moments, the little red army would be covering ankles and shins and nesting conveniently between our toes. Their sting was hot. One or two was a mild irritation, but several hundred had the victim hopping and screaming and racing around to escape the fiery pain. When molested, red ants declared thermonuclear war. Apparently, their only goal in life at that point was to sting the attacker to death and they would gladly die themselves in this singular mission. Of all the encounters, the times when they were the meanest and most determined to kill was when they came in contact with water. Red ants despise water and when presented with even a modest amount, they would go into a frenzied rage. Their speed and intensity seemed to explode. This was an odd paradox given the copious amounts of moisture that surrounded us from all sides. Let's just say that South Florida has its share of precipitation, often leaving flooded streets and gargantuan puddles. These presented ideal playgrounds for me and my crew. Forget that the neighborhood was on septic tanks and Any flooding meant what was in the tanks would soon be part of a vile brew that we played in. My mother reminded us repeatedly that this could lead to lockjaw or tetanus. This was always a scary consideration. A young, hungry boy with a voracious appetite, intent on consuming large amounts of spaghetti, cheeseburgers, and bologna sandwiches, certainly wanted to avoid any affliction that might clamp one's mouth tightly shut. On more than a few occasions, while out exploring our newly flooded environment, we would mistakenly miss a bright red floating blob and end up in the middle of a massive colony of red ants mad as heck about their recently flooded home. There would be cursing and thrashing and splashing as we did anything possible to sweep the mass of red devils off our bare legs. Sometimes we would itch and scratch for days afterward. As part of our daily lives, we were endlessly pursuing the eradication of these little red freaks. Pity the red ant. All they were trying to do was follow their genetically encoded journey through life. Anything that destroyed their elaborately built tunnels and caverns was to be eliminated so they could immediately build them anew. We sometimes discussed how mindless the whole exercise seemed for the nasty little pests and how many times they must have had to deal 
with the complete destruction of their homes. It seemed sadly pointless. With Strahd's dredging, Doric and I soon hit the red zone, a handful of ant hills with streams of the red bastards coming and going. They were scurrying to and fro, carrying huge pieces, to them, of priceless particles, tiny treasures, home to the queen. We attacked. Straws a-blowing, the roofs of their tiny kingdoms were obliterated, unveiling a seething sea of red below. We blew and dredged and blew some more. Dork and I had soon opened an entire infrastructure of connected ant colonies. The ant hills on top of the sand were like small chimneys for what lay below. It was a massive crimson network teeming with ants. We were both shocked at the size of the kingdom we had unearthed. It would seem that the entire island of sand we were crawling around on had been cavered out and inhabited by this prolific insect. Before long, in my zeal to eradicate the stinging pests, I made the most serious of mistakes. I violated the number one rule of straw dredging when I neglected to remove the straw from my mouth before I inhaled. As soon as I did it, I knew I had done it. Easily, a few hundred angry ants were sucked up and at high velocity directly into my throat. Red ants meet saliva. Now they were really mad. How can I describe the immediate terror of what I had just done? I jerked straight up and shoved Dork to the side as I staggered into the street. How does one remove hundreds of very pissed off red ants from one's throat after they have attached themselves passionately with their tiny pinchers to one soft pink mucous membranes. The first thing is to run like hell, which I did. As I raced across my front yard, I tasted an intense bitterness. Red ants are bitter. Are black ants bitter? What about other insects? Next came the burning sting that welled up from deep inside my throat. Imagine guzzling an entire bottle of Tabasco. Make that a quart. Chase it down with a handful of Chinese red peppers. I wanted to die as soon as possible. In search of a two-foot-long bottle brush, I spotted instead the next best thing. Laying out along the front of the house was a thick green garden hose. Never had a plastic hose filled with scalding hot water looked so appealing. On the run, I scooped it up, and with the brass-threaded tip in hand, I raced to the spigot behind a thick grouping of bougainvillea bushes. Into my mouth, almost down my throat, I shoved that hose and twisted the spigot wide open. There is no real description for the visceral experience that followed, just like there is no real way to describe what it's like to inhale a colony of furious red ants. A massive, high-pressure stream of superheated water blasted into my system. I saw stars, then all went black, followed by a bright, fiery red. An equally robust stream of hot water sprayed from my nostrils. My stomach filled almost instantly, and I had to rip the hose out of my mouth to avoid what felt like an impending, catastrophic tissue rupture. In accordance with the standard biological processes, the equal and opposite reaction occurred. I was soon rushing violently on my hands and knees in the front yard. Dork stood by silently and looked on. For the rest of the day, I was struck with bouts of acute indigestion and intermittent stinging in my throat, but I prevailed. Though the red ant is a tough, fearless, and persistent menace, it is nothing compared to the power and relentless chemical forces of the human digestive tract. The next day, I used the bathroom and panicked momentarily when I saw nothing but red. Then I remembered, dredging with straws. On a moonless night, Dinkle and I reached a spectacular new low in poor judgment. It's up next, Chapter 31, and it's called, We Meet Mr. Molotov. <laughs>